My name is Pastor Daniel. I'm one of the lead pastors here. Merry Christmas. Uh, today, uh, we have a family service. So if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of kids in service because we're doing everybody together, which is neat. And we also ha- are going to have an opportunity to baptize uh, some people right after the sermon. So that's going to be pretty exciting. And so someone mentioned to me, they're like, you know, because we have all this, we have kids in service, you probably should preach shorter. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. So I wore shiny shoes to distract you while I preached the same amount of time I always do. Uh, We've been in a series called The Unexpected King, and we've been looking at these prophecies from Isaiah, which all happened about 700 years before Jesus came, and prophesied that Jesus would come to set things right. And, and, And so you would think that because there were so many prophecies that were explaining this, that they wouldn't miss it, and yet everybody missed it. And so uh, we saved the last prophecy for Christmas Eve. This is the prophecy in Isaiah that Jesus, in his very first sermon, the moment that he goes public with his ministry, is going to point to, to declare the fact that he came to set things right. So we're only going to do three verses today, and so I figure about an hour per verse. (laughs) Join me in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. It says this. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord, of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Amen. I have one big point, one big takeaway today, and I'm going to attempt to prove to you as we just walk through these three verses that it really is joy to the world. It really is joy to the world to the whole world. That song didn't come out of nowhere. That pronouncement announcement didn't come out of nowhere. They didn't make that up. It is joy to the world. The first verse in 61, verse one says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now anointing is to be called to something. And I, it, it's interesting that Jesus or whoever would come based on this prophecy would have the spirit of the Lord upon them. Now why would the Holy Spirit being upon Jesus matter? We, we miss this all the time because we think of Jesus and, you know, if you, if you ever have studied Jesus, you're like, well, yeah, of course, Jesus was perfect. Like, he's God's son. I can't do the things he does. But when Jesus came and did all these miracles, walking on water, raising people from the dead, do you realize he did none of that of his own power? J- Jesus, the scripture says that he emptied himself of his divinity. He emptied himself of his own power to come to earth helpless and then with the Holy Spirit on top of him, upon him, all of the miracles he did were completely dependent on God moving or else Jesus would have looked foolish. Amen. Jesus did all of his miracles through dependence. The same Jesus that the Bible says spoke creation into existence. The same Jesus who holds all things together through the power of his word didn't do any of his miracles of his own power, but lived in complete dependency on God to show you and I what it would look like to live in complete dependency upon God. Anointed means that he was chosen. He was called to do something. And Isaiah 61, one through three, is gonna tell us that Jesus was called to do six things. And they're all in these verses right here. He was called to do six things. The first is this. Number one is he was called to bring good news to the poor. Now, this isn't just good news to poor people or people that, that, that are living financially poor. That's not really what this means. If, if it meant like that, um, it would only be for certain people, right? I mean, not everyone's poor. If you're a Dodgers fan, you're not poor. <laughs> no? Just signed Otani, right? I don't even speak poor people anymore. Concessions at the Dodger Stadium are going to be so ridiculous. It doesn't likely mean financially poor at all when you read this verse. You see, when we see poor mentioned oftentimes in Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, uh, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus explains what this is in Matthew 5, 
It's actually explained as poor of spirit, not financially poor. What does it mean? It means poor of spirit means dependent on God. Like a recognition and an acknowledgement of needing God, of being dependent on God. So, so when he says good news to the poor here in Isaiah, it means good news for those who need God, who want God, who, who recognize we are hopeless without God. This is saying get ready, hold on. If you are down, if you are depressed, if you are in the realization that you can't do it, hold on. You get good news. The second reason here says he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. What is bind up? Who's brokenhearted? The Bible would tell us that the world is broken. In fact, the whole story of the Bible is that by Genesis 3, Genesis 3 is like this far into the Bible. We call that the midpoint of the Bible because by Genesis 3, everything goes wrong. And the whole rest of the Bible is about things going wrong and then getting worse. It's kind of depressing. You see, the world was perfect, perfect shalom. Everything was as it should be in the Garden of Eden. And then we chose to disobey God. And from then, we got the curse. What is the curse? Everything's hard now. The Bible says the curse is that work is hard. Is work hard? Is it at times unfulfilling? Childbirth is hard. Relationships are hard. Life is hard. Have you tried to budget in this economy? Hard. Since when did Taco Bell cost $50? Not even sure it's real food. (laughs) Creation is broken. The world is broken. The world is dark. Do you realize how depressed you can get if you watch the news too much? I mean, we, we live in a country led by politicians who have become multimillionaires in office through insider trading. While Epstein's list is still hidden from the public because many of them are on it. It's dark, guys. It's broken. It's terrible. That's the world we live in. Romans 8.22 would say this, in fact. It would go even further than what, that, what the news would say. Romans 8.22 is to say, for we know that the whole creation, all of earth, has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The world is waiting for a hero. It is waiting for a savior. Something isn't right, and it feels hopeless. So the second reason that Jesus comes is you get hope. You get good news and you get hope. Which leads us to reasons three and four here in the scripture. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prison door. So so who who is that? That's you and me. You're like, I've never been in jail, at least not that I've told anyone about. Um, When was I a slave? When was I a prisoner? See, that, what the Bible would tell you is that's what sin has done to you and I. Romans 6, 6, and 7 says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. What does that mean? It's an inability to do right consistently. How long can you live righteously without God? How long can you live morally without God? I remember talking to a friend of mine named Forrest, and Forrest said, I don't understand. I'll go to, I'll go to a men's retreat, or I'll go to a marriage retreat, and I'm like, yes, I'm going to be a good husband. It lasts like a week. And I try really hard, and I can't do it. You ever felt like that? Oh, that is my life story. I try really hard and it is not enough. You might even trick yourself into thinking, no, no, I can do that. I actually live pretty morally. I mean, I, you know, compared to my neighbor. But what if living morally, living righteously, what if that included everything that I thought? Every thought that I had. What if true righteousness even involved feeling proud about my righteousness? It's impossible. It's impossible. I can't 
do it. I can't do it. I can't go to Walmart and not have bad thoughts about people. I can't do it. I certainly can't read Facebook. When I hear people gossiping, oh my Lord Jesus, come, I need you now. I just can't do it. I cannot live righteously. There's something wrong inside of me and there's something wrong inside of you. And I felt enslaved to it, unable to rise above it, shackled to it. I can't rescue myself no matter how hard I tried. That's bondage. That's slavery. That's prison. And the good news of Christ is you get freedom. You get good news. You get hope. And I got freedom. Freedom from bondage. Freedom from slavery. In verse two, it says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, it would be really easy to look over that little verse, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and kind of not understand it and go, yeah, that sounds nice. But, but what you don't understand is that it, in Hebrew, that says something totally different. You see, in Hebrew, if we go all the way back to the original laws that, G, that, that God set up for his people, there was this idea of a Sabbath year. And a Sabbath year said this, uh, once, one year out of every seven, you will not plant in a field. So if you're planting every year in the field, the seventh year, you won't plant in that field. That field needs to t- have time off. And in, in that, that seventh year, you have to forgive all debts. So if you have someone that, that you've held the debt for, you have to release that debt on the seventh year. That's the Sabbath year. And if you have slaves, if someone had sold themselves as a bond servant into slavery in order to pay debt because they didn't have money, the seventh year, you'd have to release the slaves. It's the Sabbath year. It happens once every seventh. That's often taught incorrectly. You've probably heard that taught as the year of Jubilee. That's not what it was. It was called the Sabbath year. But then in Leviticus 25, there's this crazy concept that gets set up. And as far as we know, the Israelites actually never did it, even though God told them to. Sounds like the Israelites, right? Not like you and I do that, though. We do everything we're supposed to. Right. Right. The seventh year was a Sabbath year. Every seventh Sabbath year, so seven times seven, that's 49 years, right? Every 49 years. On the 10th day of the seventh month, they were to announce the day of atonement. And they were announcing that the next year, the 50th year, would be a year of jubilee, the whole year. And the year of Jubilee, not only were all debts forgiven, not only were all slaves free, but any land that had been taken or sold was returned to its rightful owner on the year of Jubilee. That's the year of the Lord's favor. So why is Isaiah mentioning a year of Jubilee when they never even did it? The people didn't, they ignored it. because you and I are going to get a lost land back. You ever had to sell something that you you didn't want to sell just to survive? You ever have one of those like a pawn star moments? You know, where you had something really valuable, you you, you just, you you weren't gonna make it, you had to go sell it, and so it's this priceless air room, and they're like, best I can do for you is $50. So you say, what good was it to be released from slavery if then you sold all of your land, you had no way to make a living, you had nowhere to live, and you were homeless? The Bible would say that you and I are sojourners on this world. This is not our home. But there's a day coming, listen to me, there's a day coming when we're going home. There's a day coming when we're not homeless anymore. And what Isaiah is saying here in verse two of chapter 61, is there's a day coming when everything is restored. It's not just that we are freed from slavery, it is that we will be restored to a rightful home. This means freeing the captives and forgiving debts and even taking the homeless and restoring them to a real home. This is you and me, slaves to sin, in a debt we couldn't pay, Jesus goes to our cross with his blood, frees us from the bondage of sin so that we're no longer slaves. But then, just like a a late night infomercial, but wait, there's more. 
restoring a land, restoring a homeland, a rightful place to live in peace. This world is melting around us. You see it. It's impossible to ignore. It gets darker and darker and darker. And I just want to remind you guys, this is not our home. Jesus tells us that we have a home. We're not lost anymore. There's a promised land and Jesus is going to restore that. You get your rightful home back. The place you belong. The fifth thing that he is anointed and called to do in this prophecy, is to announce the day of vengeance of our God. What is the day of vengeance? That does not sound very Christmassy. See, the very thing that you and I would point to as hope is also disaster for those who don't know Christ. The coming promises of Jesus, they get you and I to a point of hope and joy, are that God will put everything right. To put everything right, that means that there must be justice. See, we're safe from justice because Christ's blood covers us. But on that same day, the day we look forward to, that is terror for those who don't know Jesus. He is a God of justice. There's something in all of us that longs for justice. Don't you want justice? Don't you long for the day where every horrible wrong is punished? Every innocent person that has been hurt or abused or terrorized, that is put right? God will set everything right again. There is real punishment coming. The sixth and final reason that Jesus was anointed to come. To comfort all who mourn. To comfort all who mourn. You see this in the text in three ways. I want to look at these three things. How is Jesus going to comfort us who mourn? Here's the first to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. So the very thing that was burned and destroyed will produce beauty. So so if you you turn back into ancient times, it was common that when you were mourning, when you were grieving the loss of someone, you would cover your head with ashes to signify that you were grieving, that there was loss, that you were mourning. But in a wedding you would cover your head with a headdress to announce the wedding, the celebration. And so listen to what this verse is saying. To give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. Did did you see the difference here? Uh, Let me ask you this. What's the difference between a funeral and a wedding? Have you ever had to do both in like the same little short period of time? You ever felt how awkward that is to go to a funeral and a wedding like in one weekend? No, nobody? It's very awkward. Those are not the same vibe. We can at least agree on that, yes? They don't feel the same. You don't say the same things. If you celebrate at the wrong run, it's really weird, right? If you're, if you're mourning at the wrong one, also, that's probably a problem. It's appropriate reactions for each. You don't want to mix those two up. What's the difference between a funeral and a wedding? Hope and joy. In a funeral, we're lamenting the loss of what was and now won't be. You're looking back at what was and going, it won't be that anymore. It's gone. It's lost forever. And in a wedding, in a wedding, you're hoping for things to come, but not yet. It's the very beginning in a wedding. All of the the wonderful things, it's anticipated. It's it's coming. It's, It's not even here yet. We're celebrating what will be. One looks back, one looks forward. What's the Bible saying? I'm going to replace the lament, the mourning, the grieving of what was for the celebration, the anticipation of what will be. And it will be a comfort to those who mourn. Everything about Jesus is a wedding feast, not graveside tears. That's why we don't lament and grieve even at his crucifixion because we know what's coming, which is his resurrection. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. Someday, someday, we will be glad and stop mourning. There will be no mourning. And we're called to joy now because of that hope someday. 
So because of that, we can hope, even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of a, of a dark world, even, even when, when you're in, it feels like life is so overwhelming that you're in this tiny little boat and the waves are gonna capsize you and come over the top, you can still be joy because of what will be, because there is a day coming where there will be no mourning. There will be no tears. There will be no pain. And the third way in which he comforts those who mourn, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. So from quitting to praising, from quitting to enduring, from giving up to holding on. Uh, I I recently had surgery on my elbow and the doctor said you can't lift anything with your arm. And so I, who like to work out, have found that there's only one thing that I can do, which is my least favorite thing in the world, which is running. Anyone also hate running? The Bible says that only the wicked run when no one's chasing them. (laughs) All I do is question my life while I run. (laughs) Why am I doing this? Please, Lord, return now and don't let me finish this run. I have this little app that tracks effort over each month, and if I get to 1,300 points, I keep my status but I can't do anything now. And so I wait till the very end of the month and I have all the points and I still haven't got any. And then I have to run three miles a day to get it. And I hate it. And I do it anyways because I'm a procrastinator. Uh, You guys don't do that. You don't ever procrastinate. So it's just me that I'm talking about. And so I have to run and it takes me forever to run these things and I'm, I'm, I'm running and I'm like, I'm done by like, I don't know, 60 seconds in, you know? I'm like, I'm already, I'm ready to quit. Life feels like this sometimes. There's no end in sight. There's no hope in sight. There's no relief in sight. I don't know if I can hold on any longer. And the Bible says, he will give you endurance. He won't just give you hope. He won't just give you good news. He won't just give you freedom. He will give you endurance. God will help you keep running the race. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hebrews 12, 1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He's going to give us endurance to keep going. And this comfort, all this comfort that's been described, these, these six different things that, that have all been types of comfort for us, the good news, the freedom from bondage, comforting those who mourn, it's gonna lead us to this right here that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I, that is, again, this, this terminology that we see in the Bible all the time that's organic, right? It talks a lot about planting and growing, planting and growing over and over in the Bible. Why? What Jesus will do for you is he will plant inside of you righteousness that begins to grow organically from the inside out. And and guys, this is why we have never, ever in our history legislated righteousness. It doesn't matter what your laws are, they're always from the outside in. And we're trying to push on you the law or we're trying to push on you morality or we're trying to push on you guilt or we're trying to push on you wisdom but it's always from the outside in and none of it ever works because I'm evil in here. But what Jesus does is he plants in us his spirit of righteousness and then it begins to grow outward. And it is the only thing that actually works. There's often been a complaint that Jesus gives such freedom in his salvation that it's simply just a license for us to go and sin. But the thing is that when he plants in us righteousness, you, you, you can't ever go and do something that is not part of your nature. An orange tree doesn't produce apples, amen? If an orange tree produced apples, it wouldn't be an orange tree, it would be a? That's just the way it works. 
I know that we're pretty messed up at this point with biology in our country, but I'll just tell you, I think this is still the case. Here's what I mean by that. Um, If you plant an acorn, you get an oak tree. And so when I see an oak tree, I know for certain that what was planted was an acorn. A hundred percent of the time. Because if I see a cactus, it was never an acorn. Is, yes? We're all in agreement, correct? Yes. What Jesus does when he saves you, when, when Jesus saved me, he changed this heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And listen, I still ran from him. Even after he saved me, I ran from him. But here's what I need you to know. He has long legs. And he just chases you down. And he has way more endurance than I do. And at some point, I finally just said, I give up. And it's the best day of your life. It says, oaks of righteousness, because what Jesus will do for us is he will plant his righteousness inside of you. And really, all of your work, all of your effort after that, you could never plant it yourself, is simply to do things to help it grow faster. You can help it grow slower, you can help it grow faster. You couldn't put it in yourself, you couldn't plant yourself. You couldn't wake yourself up out of the grave, you were dead. That's not how that works. And Jesus saves you. And, 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 and his righteousness begins to grow in you. Your job is to recognize it and then begin to foster it. I I love the idea of planting that the Bible uses over and over again to describe the process of God saving us. God plants something in us that turns into beauty. Look at the language that we see here in Isaiah 61. He takes ashes, he turns them to beauty. He takes mourning, he turns it into gladness. He takes graves he turns them into gardens. These are the words of actually my most listened to song this year. I've listened to this on repeat like hundreds of times in a year. Just over and over again, I put it on repeat, just listen to it again and again. It's written, a guy, uh, written by a guy named Brandon Lake, who is an absolutely terrible theologian, but a talented musician. <laughs> I want, just, just listen to these words. Play this for, real quick. That song is right out of Isaiah 61. You're the only one who can. It wasn't me. It wasn't you. It wasn't some self-help book. It wasn't some wise, sage person. It wasn't some political party or government system or societal progress. It was Jesus. He's the only one that can. And he did. And he turns mourning into gladness and he turns ashes into beauty. This prophecy is about Jesus coming filled with the Holy Spirit on a mission from the Father to bring good news, to repair what was broken, to free slaves to sin, to announce the jubilee and the judgment, to comfort those who are at the bottom at the end of their rope to give them beauty from ashes and mourning into gladness and to change your giving up into undying praise for God. This is the gospel that he came and he lived in this mess as a human without his power, dependent on God, both as a model for us to follow and as a perfect sacrifice for the payment. And he did so 
so that you and I could be called sons and daughters of the king. This is the message. Everything's gone wrong. No one can fix it. So I'm going to come and I'm going to take the worst people, the lowest people, the lost people, people like me and you, and I'm going to change everything. Isaiah is saying someone is coming to do this. It would be 700 years or so, but about 700 years later, you're going to turn to Luke 4. And in Luke 4, Jesus is going to give what is basically his first sermon. It's not much of a sermon, it's very short. He's at the synagogue during the Sabbath and he's going to go and he's going to select a specific scroll from, that's how they had all the scriptures and he's going to unroll it and he's going to turn, this is his first public statement, to Isaiah 61. And he's going to read to the crowd Isaiah 61 verses one and two. And when he finishes, he's going to slowly put it away And every eye in the synagogue is watching him, wondering why would you pick Isaiah 61? And he's going to look at them and say this, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What is he saying? I'm him. I'm him. And I'm here. And everything changes. I'm here to set things right. I'm here to free the prisoners. I'm here to comfort the downtrodden. I'm here to change your mourning into dancing. And the only appropriate response to that news is inexpressible joy. There's no other reaction to understanding what happened than joy. It's joy. Joy that grows like a seed in us and flowers into something that's just overflowing and life-changing because we know how dark the world is and I know how dark I am and now I have good news. Now I have comfort. Now I have hope. Now I have a home because I have his spirit planted in me and growing and nothing will ever be the same again. For me, uh, personally, this may not be your story, but this is my story. This is the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Jesus found me while I was running from him as fast as I could. And he was relentless with me in gentleness, in love, in people chasing after me and loving me for absolutely no reason until I finally had to come to the recognition that he wasn't going to leave me alone. He loved me too much. Listen, the greatest words I've ever been able to share is this. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be. He saved me and he changed me and he wants to do the same for you. Tim Keller said this uh, years ago and I absolutely love this. It's not just joy for you and me, it is. It's this, the idea that God would become flesh and permanently inhabit a human body means God is not simply, is not out simply to take your poor little soul which is falling apart and put it together but to take the entire universe which is falling apart and put it together. He will make all things right. He saved me and he wants to save you too. And that's our point today. It really is joy to the world. As we leave or as we transition, because we're gonna do baptisms in just a minute, um, I wanna talk about for, for a moment, the difference between happiness and joy so that you have a firm understanding of this. See, happiness is external to internal. And here's what I mean by that. Happiness is when something external to you happens and then as it happens and you react to it because it's good, right? So, so outside events happen. Uh, uh, what's a really good thing? A Taylor Swift concert. 
something external happens, you get tickets, right? And that changes how you feel in the moment because external things now impress internal reactions. That's happiness. But joy is internal to external. It goes the opposite direction. Joy is something that happens inside of you and then it, it actually spreads from you and it changes not only the things that are happening but the way that you would see the world. You see, I have confidence and I have hope in him who is faithful and unchanging. Therefore, regardless of what happens, I have confidence which leads to joy. And so because of what he's done in me, I can't even see everything that's happening the same way anymore. And so whether it's good or it's bad, I, I'm still joyful. And so I can have joy in the midst of grief. I can have joy in the midst of trials. I can have joy in the midst of deep and dark circumstances because I can't extinguish or change what he's done in me. It's joy. It's joy for the whole world because it's for every person who would respond to him. My question for you is, do you want that joy? I can't force you to love Jesus. I, if I could, if I could hit you with a stick, I've told you this before, and make you love Jesus, you guys would be sore. <laughs> the greatest challenge to being in ministry is I can't make you love Jesus. But, but here's what I can do. I can plead with you to recognize when he's working in your life. I can tell you how much he's working in my life, what he's done and what he's doing and what he will do. And I can tell you without any doubt, it is worth it. It is worth it. And when you begin to realize, listen to me, when you begin to realize that God is doing something in you, when you begin to have conversations in your head about spiritual things, when you begin to ask questions or think about spiritual things, when you begin to have feelings and thoughts and questions and concerns and ideas that you've never had before, you didn't come up with them. He is saving you. He is planting in you a seed of righteousness and your job is simply to respond to what he's doing. Don't ignore it. Don't run away from it. Don't try to extinguish the flame that he is sparking up in your soul. Respond to it. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord, that he came for your soul, that he came for your salvation, that he came for your righteousness, and that he has great things in store for you. Respond to him. Here's what we're gonna do. Um, if you're getting baptized and you've already signed up for that today, you're gonna head right over there to the pretty lady in the corner, She's going to get you ready. That's someone's mama. <laughs> if you have never been baptized, but you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he would say the very next step is to go Facebook official with him. It is a public declaration of your faith. He would say to be baptized. And the good news for you today is we have towels and extra clothes and shirts and all sorts of things. So even if you bring your best clothes today, we've got a change of clothes for you. Because your job is not to save yourself. Your job is to respond to him saving you. So if you want to do that today, I want to encourage you. You will never experience a better Christmas than obeying Jesus. All you need to do is walk over to the corner and we will talk with you and pray with you and dunk you. <laughs> and we'll love doing it. In just a minute as we baptize everybody, I'm going to, a couple reminders for you. Congregation, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when someone comes to Christ. So when we baptize, all of Rez is going to rejoice. We're going to celebrate like it's 1999. Man, that's an old reference. Uh, I'm getting old, getting old. Um, I want to pray as we uh, transition just briefly, and then I want everybody to stand up. We're going to sing a Christmas medley. 
Come on, come on. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for saving us. God, for sending your son to come and walk and live amongst us. God, we had no hope. And then you came. God, I ask that your spirit just pour out upon us. That you bind up the brokenhearted. That you comfort those here who are suffering. And God, that you continue to draw people to yourself, draw them into response to what you're doing in their hearts and in their souls. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the greatest gift that was ever given. God, remind us of joy every single day when we wake up. Thank you for what you're doing and continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen.